Right after the meal, Jake and Danny carried the dinghy across the sand to a small wooded dell in the dunes where they pitched a tent for the night. Makes no sense to me when there are perfectly good berths on board Harmony. Let's call it the excess energy of youth. Findhorn, named after the river which drains into the sea here, is no ordinary Scottish coastal community. The village used to be three miles up the Murray, where there was a little bit of Jacobite nastiness. The French had chosen Findhorn as a safe and sympathetic place to land spies, messages and money for Bonnie Prince Charlie. The English spotted the small French ship and thought they had her cornered with two English vessels patrolling the Firth. The river mouth was too dangerous at the time to navigate in a big English man of war without good local knowledge, and good locals were saying nothing to the English. But under cover of misty darkness and well guided by misguided locals, the Frenchies snuck away like thieves in the night. There is a theory though that our Jolly Jack Tars were told by head office to let them go because the message the Frenchies were taking back to Louis XVI was that Bonnie Prince Charlie was a bit of a numpty and had made a real hash of things. And we, as in the English and most of the Lowland Scots, wanted Louis to pull the plugs on the whole Jacobite power grab affair rather than stoking even more fires by sending even more ships loaded with money and guns. Perhaps, though, old Louis should have spent more time thinking about his own troubles because he was the one who ended up on the receiving end of the French Revolution. He was, you may recall, married to the awful cake comment woman. They both eventually ended up with a meeting with Madame Guillotine. But this Jacobite sneaking around happened at the old Findhorn because during the late 1700s and early 1800s the river started moving to the east to a new course it had been working on for a while. It was coming along nicely so bit by bit the river moved its bed to the current position three miles further down the coast. The act wasn't done in any great speed but more and more of the Findhorn waters left by a new channel. Eventually, the villagers clocked that the river really had moved and wasn't coming back, so they moved too. Stones, paving slabs, roof timbers, tiles, lock, stock and barrel. Almost no one died in this fairly trouble-free operation, just people quietly reacting to the remarkable, ever-changing geography of the Murray Firth. The morning broke bright and clear and as the sun came up I drank my tea and passed the time of day with the man in the wayfarer. He and his dog had just spent the night around the corner in the old bar. Bloody good on him. I resolved that the old bar would be worth a visit on my by now inevitable return to the Murray. Look at this mist coming in here, look. Well, Danny and Jake are about to get enveloped again. 1.2 metres here. I think it's time we've committed ourselves to going aground. And we can walk ashore. We moved the boat over to the village side of the inlet and tied up to the old stone jetty. No charge. It dries at low tide, but that's a good thing, as it gives me a chance for a quick scrub. We spent the day ashore in Findhorn, but the bar is probably the most artistic natural thing I've ever seen. The sand shapes are sublime and the mixing of the peaty golden water from the land and the crystal clear seawater from the firth create alluring contrasts.
about midday, three fiddlers started up. Very nice indeed. Findhorn is home to the Findhorn community. A township where people try to live holistic lives, whatever that means. And this is the place as seen through Jake's lens. I think he approved of almost everything he saw here. They grow a fair bit of their own food, which is tough if not only your houses, but also your gardens are built on the shifting sands of the Murray. They run all sorts of courses here. Vegetable gardening, weaving, massage, yoga, fondle your own chakra. Wonderful, well-meaning, community-minded people, rather over-keen on holding meetings, as I understand. One of my neighbours was the local GP here for a while. He described it as lovely, but just a smidge intense at times. We stayed another night in Findhorn, and the next day up came a stiff southerly, so we rode it across to Cromarty. chuff, powering through the swell with that surging energy only boats under sail can unleash. Jake and I were really enjoying the sail. Danny was, I confess, starting to look just a tad green. But just in the nick of time, guess who turned up? The instant cure for seasickness. As dolphin experiences go, this was far from classic. Grey skies, grey seas, grey dolphins. But judging by her squeals, it still seemed to hit the spot with Danny. I've seen and spent time with a lot of different animals. But two stand out as guaranteed to raise the spirits. Domestically, of course, the dog is always good to have around. In the natural world, though, there's nothing more guaranteed to make you happy than dolphins in the wild. Their exuberant mastery of their medium is astonishing. And best of all, they appear to want to spend time with us, which is a very rare and precious thing in a wild animal. Then the rain started, so the camera was put away until we were safely tied up in Cromarty Harbour and plugged into the lecky to get the fan heater going. And one of those little miracles of this project happened.
County Firth is one of the finest natural harbours in the world, 20 miles long and 40 metres deep. Now it's used to build and store oil rigs. You can tell the state of the world economy by the number of rigs here. When things are going well, the place is almost empty. But when the economy hits the buffers, there are scores of them in here waiting for things to improve. In the past, the Navy loved the place because it provided great depth and shelter. Its narrow entrance is guarded by the suitors, the two 600-foot high rocks ideal for gun emplacements. Suitors, incidentally, is a Gaelic word for shoemaker, because the rocks apparently look like a couple of old blokes bent over their work. Whiskey is powerful stuff when it comes to firing up the imagination. The harbour at Cromarty is a bit of a mess. The original stonework is from the 1770s, which is fine, but during the Second World War the Navy expanded it with steel reinforced structures, which are now falling apart and neither the sailors nor the fishermen are prepared to pay for the repairs, so the place is just falling down. We spent a lovely day hanging around, but didn't go far inland up the Cromarty. Maybe next year. it certainly started to look as though something was brewing. So Jake and Danny decided to take the land route to our next harbour while Jill and I sailed the 30 odd miles along the coast. However, they've yet to invent an infallible weatherman and we had some Brilliant sailing, with the wind and the tide behind us for a fair chunk of the way.
We came into Helmsdale to be greeted by the harbour master and settled down for the deluge while Jake turned his attention to preparing that day's catch. Which is pretty tough for a bloke who's a vegan. Until 1970 there was a castle on top of the hill and it was here that a rather nasty piece of work called Isabel Sinclair attempted to improve her son's chances of inheriting the massive Sutherland estates by poisoning her own nephew, Earl Sutherland, his wife and their son, while entertaining them to a slap-up dinner. Isabel's dastardly plot went awry when her own son also drank the poison, killing all four of them, and she herself committed suicide just before she was due to be executed for the crime. And the story ended up highly transformed as the plot for Shakespeare's Hamlet. It was a classic Scottish toff-on-toff -toff killing, something the Scottish aristocracy from Robert the Bruce on down have been very keen on. There's also this monument to the clearances, which were some of the most complete and ruthless on the coast. It was the Sutherlands who did it, again. Admittedly, the Sutherland at the time was an Englishman, and he inherited the title when he married Elizabeth Sutherland, who was the heiress to the estate. Sutherland is one of the main reasons why us English get blamed for all the clearances stuff. However, the records show 
that it was Lady Sutherland, a native Scot, who was the main driving force behind clearing her people off her hills to make way for her sheep. The Highlanders were given tiny plots of land down by the valley and told to build their own houses, grow some vegetables, become fishermen and generally HTFU, which is a tough call for people who were basically Highland cowboys. Some succeeded as market gardeners and some really took to fishing, but the rest threw in the towel and headed off to the New World, Canada and New Zealand mostly, where they could return to being livestock farmers, and jolly good they were at it too. There was once a pretty good-sized fishing fleet here, 200 boats working out of Helmsdale. They fished from here and then headed south to plunder the fish stocks of northern England. At one time, there were eight pubs in the town, plus just one school for 40 kids, which tells you something about the priorities of fishermen. Eventually, it did stop raining, and I could stop mithering about history, and we set off on the 20-mile coastal hop to Libster. But there was no wind, and there was a swell, so it was 20 miles of rolling, slatting motoring. The sort of day that makes you question why you ever became a sailor. But on the good side, Libster Harbour is a real delight. For starters, it's a harbour without a town, which was built away from the smelly fishing harbour at the top of the hill. The sun shone on us in Libster, which always helps to make a place seem as lovely as it can be. The harbour was built in 1800 and by 1859 there were 350 herring boats working out of here. 1500 fishermen, a massive, massive community. But within another 50 years, it had dropped away to almost nothing because they'd fished out all the herring. These guys just don't learn. The heavens did open for a bit that evening, that's for sure, but the next day the sun shone and we pushed on towards Wick.
Sadly, another rolly old day. and with the wind only picking up towards the end of the 20 miles. Finally, we were in the harbour, which is generally regarded as the jumping off place for those heading for Orkney and Shetland. I was beginning to feel we're making some real progress on this journey around the UK.